Hey everyone, welcome to our YouTube channel. My name is Cora and I'm the media ministry leader here at Restoration Life. Our prayer is that today's message encourages you and lifts you up in the most powerful way. Let's take a listen.
on right now, why don't you just lift up your own song of worship to him?
place, the presence of the Lord. So let us remember as we hold those emblems in our hands, what Christ did for us. Let us partake from the goodness of the Lord and let us never forget allow anything in our lives to take that place. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your presence in this place, for you allowing us to be able to feast at this table, Lord, to remember you, what you did on the cross for us so that we may be forgiven and free from our sin. We are so grateful for that sacrifice. We thank you in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. We want to welcome you to Restoration Life Church. If it is your first time here, we want to say welcome home. And if you are watching online, thank you for joining us. Why don't you turn around and greet somebody, say hello, for, and look for somebody that you've never met before. Come on, let's give God a shout of praise in the house this morning. Oh, come on, let's give God a shout of praise in the house this morning. Look, I know, I know you sleepy. You know, you woke up like, oh, I get up so early. That little hour got you done. It's all right. You're here. You made it. Praise God. You guys, you have a two Sunday grace period. Two Sunday grace period. You got this Sunday to be late. You got next Sunday to be late. After that, I don't want to hear like, it's the time change. You're fine. All right. We're excited to have everybody in the house today. It's so good to see everyone. We're going to take this opportunity right now to give um, the offering envelopes. If you want to give by cash or card, that way it's right there on the front of your pew. You can also give online through our website and you can give our app. That's one of the most convenient ways to give. And also you can just use your QR code reader. Just hold your phone up to the screen and you can give that way. Um, last week I talked about maturing in our faith. And an area that a lot of maturing needs to happen is in our understanding of tithing and generosity. Because sometimes when we come in and we come to this moment, there's this feeling that comes over us. And often it's because we don't understand what it is we're, we're actually doing. You know, as a pastor, I get a lot of crazy emails from all over the world. I get, you know, the Nigerian prince who checks in, like lets me know there's like 10 million in the bank account for me to get with them. Um, we get asked to support different things where like, hey, we're starting a ministry with crystals and we want your support for our crystals and all these kind of things. So I get crazy stuff that comes. But a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from someone in the Philippines. And my initial response was, uh, here we go again. Let me just keep scrolling. But I started to read it and it said, hey, pastor, I just want to say thank you. Me and my family, we're, we live in the Philippines and we're able to watch you guys on Sunday. And we've been tremendously blessed by the, by the messages. And, you know, I started to get my neighbors and we gather our family and we just love what you guys are doing. The only thing we ask is, can you please send us what you guys teach on? Okay, it would help us so much. Can you just send us some teaching? Because we want to continue to grow with God here and be connected to you guys. And also we ask that you pray for us that we're able to build a church here in the Philippines. And it just warmed my heart so much and it just let me know like what we sow a seed into matters. It matters that we invest into the church. It matters that we invest into the right things because it goes well beyond just these walls. We are literally reaching people all around the world, church. We are literally sharing the gospel this very moment, right now, we got people tuning in from all over the world who are hearing the gospel for the first time. And we would not be able to do that had we not sown seeds here, investing, getting the right people, getting the right equipment, getting the right technology that does come at a cost. But now we're able to continue on the mission that God gave this house. And so that's the maturity and our understanding of generosity and tithing. We should never give out of reluctancy or compulsion but give out of the goodness of our heart and joy knowing that the gospel is moving around the world. Amen? Father, we just want to say thank you. 
thank you for all your provision. Thank you for blessing this house. We thank you for every single person watching online around the world and their generosity. God, continue to have your hand upon them. Continue to allow your word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to move around this world and use Restoration Life as a vessel. Father, we ask that you be here with us this day, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And everyone said, amen. Come on, give God some praise today. Hey, real quick, all my fellas, make some noise. That's what I'm talking about. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night, 7.30. Let's get here. Let's pack this place out. Let's be excited. We got Jeremy Johnson coming to be with us. He's going to minister for our very first Man Up Monday of the year. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. We also, afterwards, we're going to spend some time fellowshipping. We got tacos, EK, so we're going to eat good. And, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to pre-sell some tickets so we don't have to wait in line, get you guys taken care of. Everybody's going to grow up. We're going to hang out. We're going to fellowship and enjoy each other. Um, coming up really soon is our... Good Friday service. This is going to be something you don't want to miss out on. It's not like a regular church service. We are going to get into it, breaking down the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in a very unique and beautiful way. We're going to do it two times on Good Friday, one at 6 p.m. and one at 8 p.m. What we're asking from everybody is that you take the time out to go online at RSVP. There is no cost to this whatsoever. We just want to make sure we don't overload one of the services and we have enough space for everybody. So if you can go online, that'll be available uh, probably next week. So be sure to stay tuned with our social media and then check on our website and you'll be able to go on there and RSVP as well as for Easter Sunday, which we'll be doing three services on Resurrection Sunday, uh, 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11.30. You'll be able to RSVP for those as well. For all my ladies, check it out. I know some of you, like you try to go online and register for Radiant, it was out. Listen, we were able to add some more slots, but they're going very fast. So if you want those slots, I suggest you pull out your phone right now before Pastor Eddie gets into his message and you miss your opportunity. Without further ado, would you please welcome up our lead pastor, Pastor Eddie Vargas. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's so good to have you here and watching us online. And man, God's doing some really cool stuff here at Restoration Life. And before I go any further, I just, just want to say thank you to everybody who serves every Sunday. Um, you guys make everything look so effortless. But we know that there are hundreds and hundreds of hours um, of preparation that goes into everything that everybody does on Sunday morning. So can we just thank them, church? Just thank everybody that just serves. And, and, and with that in mind, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, um, I don't know, is, is, is David, is David here? Cora, is he here? Where is he? Where's David? Where's, I don't, I don't see him. Where? Sir, where's sir? Where are you at? Where are you at? Oh, there you are. Hey, can you come here for a sec? Can you just come here for a sec? In fact, do me a favor and, and just come up here. Can you just come up here for just a second? Um, years ago, what a lot of people don't know, and I, I'm not doing this to put you on blast because I know that you hate this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you do. Um, but years ago, um, David stepped into a position uh, of leadership um, because we had a transition that took place. And um, man, you did such a, a remarkable job at stepping in at a critical time. In fact... We wouldn't have a media team with everything that we do at Restoration Life to help your worship experience be the way that it is without, without David and his heart and his gifting. And um, I think there's some people that want to come up and say thank you um, real quickly. And, and again, you can take off your mask. You're in a safe space now. Um, 
sir. <laughs> and um, I just, I just honor you. We want to honor you and say thank you. And so, um, David um, released the ministry to Cora, and Cora has been leading um, the media team. And I think, I think the team has something for you. If you guys maybe could just bring. Bring it up to him. Like, yeah, look, look at how many people. And there's a lot more that make up this team. But um, they, they've, I don't know if you, if you guys got a mic or anything. That's cool. If not, but really, this is, come here. You, nobody ever gets to see you guys because you guys are like behind cameras. You guys are in, you know, the social media room. You guys are producing, planning, organizing, shooting, setting up, taking down, editing. Um, just, this is, this is your media team, church. This is all the people that are on your media team. And um, David led this team at a very critical time. And we just, we honor you. And now uh, I found out that you're transitioning out of the team and you're going to be doing something new. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, here at Restoration Life. And, um, but we wanted to make sure that we honored where honor is doing. So, Cora. David. Hello. necessities that I need. Um, the team has totally grown, and that's all a part of your fruit, and we just thank you so much, you and your wife, Teresa, and your family for just putting in the sacrifice. To me. So we wanted to just honor you and thank you so much for everything that you've done, and we can't wait to see what God does in your life and in your family um, from here on out. So David, thank you so, so much. <laughs> There's a one-way ticket to the Death Star. <laughs> you guys never get to see everybody that lives in that fish tank every Sunday morning, but there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people, a lot of amazing families and members of your church that labor in love on Saturdays and Sundays and Monday and every special event, they're grinding away. And so thank all of you for all that you guys do. You guys are incredible. Nobody ever really gets to see you guys, but thank you so much. David, man, what a blessing you are, bro. Love you, man. Love you. I just... We just felt like we needed to honor you. You're welcome. What, a, what, a, what an incredible family of God here at Restoration Life. And we just want to honor all of you for being here with us today. And um, I, need, I want everybody to do this. Just everybody do this. Just kind of loosen it up a little bit. Because I need you to shake off your feelings for this service. Is that okay? Come on, shake it up. Shake it off. Shake it off. Because I need to say some things that I think are going to equip you and help you and hopefully empower you to do what I believe God has called and anointed all of you to do as the church. We are the church. We don't go to church. We are the church. And I thank God that we have a church that was willing to do everything that it could to honor God by serving His people. And uh, we're going on a year that we've been in quarantine and and now the nation is starting to open up. But aren't you glad that your church opened up early to be able to serve one another in love? And so thank you to everyone that, that made that possible. It, with, without all of you, it, it, it's impossible for us to do together what we know that we should be doing. Um, but I want to share a message that I've entitled, 
Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? And before I, I get into this, I need, I need you to license me. Like last year, you guys, or early this year, you licensed me to pastor you, to equip you, to train you, to instruct you, to, to rebuke you if need be. Um, but more than anything else, to teach you what the Bible says so that your faith can increase in Christ and you can fulfill God's plan and purpose for your individual lives and our corporate lives together as a church. So I just want to pray. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment, we just want to pray because we, we, don't, we don't want our emotions to get in the way of truth. And we don't want our paradigms to get in the way of truth. And we don't want our preferences and our opinions to get in the way of truth. But we want to hear the truth because if we know the truth, it'll set us free. As the Holy Spirit speak, our hearts and minds are open to instruction. We thank you, Father, for your living word. We thank you that you're with us even now. That we're never alone in anything that we go through. Because you love us, you're always with us. So Father, we give you this next 45 minutes and we ask that you speak to us individually right where we're at. Speak to our marriages, speak to our parenting, speak to our social status, speak to who we are in you so that we can better reflect you to a hopeless and dying world. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, come on, can somebody celebrate Jesus for just 30 seconds? Come on, just for 30 seconds. We just celebrate Jesus. Come on, can somebody make a joyful noise unto the Lord? We love to celebrate Jesus. If we're going to make anyone famous, it's going to be Jesus. And Years ago, I was asked by a very dear friend of mine. He said this. He, made the, he asked me this question. If your, church were to ever to, if your church were ever to close, with your, will, would your city miss you? Would your government, government officials know that you're not there? Would anybody care if your church closed down? And after this year of quarantine and, you know, we're getting ready to enter into a new season of life, at least here in the United States or maybe even more so in California, I would say that our church would be extremely missed if we weren't here in the South Bay. And so I thank God for all of you standing beside us through every decision that we've made in order to stay open and be the church that God loves to use and move through. So in response to that question, if your church were to leave or your church were to close down, would your city miss you? I would respond with a hard, absolutely yes. We know that we've made a lot of impact together as the bride of Christ here in our community. If, when it goes to feeding families, counseling brokenness in families and in marriages and in individuals, but even more importantly than anything else, by advancing in the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm honored to lead a fearless church that was willing to lay its life down for others. Because many of our, our families and many of our people at Restoration Life literally put themselves in harm's way to bring you the good news literally put themselves in harm's way to remain open and to broadcast and to film and to edit and to work in honoring the will of God for our church for this season that we're living in. And so we've been unashamedly testifying of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we'll continue to do so. But as I think about that, I think about where we're at as a society I think about where we're at as a nation. I think about where we're at as Angelinos. I think about where we're at as a government and as a superpower. I think about all those things. But what I want you to hear real quickly, and I need to kind of just lay this foundation a little bit, 
because I don't want anybody to misinterpret what I'm saying. Because I know that in our church, in this house of, 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 of a beautiful, multicultural environment of families, that there are people that sit on, the diff, on, on different aisles of politics. You know, I know that there are people here that, that are on TikTok, or on Instagram, or on Facebook, on Twitter, on Snapchat, on all of these different platforms, or on some and not all. So there's a grand variation of people here at our church that represent Restoration Life. I know that there are liberals in our church. I know that there are Republicans in our church, that there are Democrats in our church, that there are conservatives in our church. I know that our church is made up of a lot of different people with a lot of different political bias and political opinions and, and social justice warriors and, and you know, want to, want to tackle a lot of systemic race issues. And, and, and listen to me clearly when I say this, that those things are worth having a conversation about. But they're not worth allowing division to come into our church. We are a kingdom people. The church is a theocracy, not a democracy. We don't have a Congress. We don't have a Senate. We don't even have a president. We have a king, and his name is Jesus. We are a kingdom people. And so the king will always have say-so over everything and anything else in our life. And so I honor those that sit on different aisles of different, different issues. I may not agree with you, but you're my brother or you're my sister in Christ. And I will never allow any of those things to bring division between us. By the same token, I pray and I hope as a, as a citizen of the United States of America that I am allowed my own political preference as well. But it will never take precedent over the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, let me break it down to you this way. Before I am a citizen of the United States, I am a citizen of heaven. And if I am a citizen of heaven, being a son of heaven, God has called you and I to be ambassadors of heaven. In fact, the Bible teaches me that I am not of this world. That I am just a pilgrim passing through. There's an expiration date on my life. And one day, it's going to expire. And what's Im most important to me as your pastor is not that I swayed you from one party to the next, from one individual to another individual. The only one that I want to make famous is Jesus. The only one that I care about that you follow is Jesus. The only one that I care about that you submit to is Jesus. And so I come and communicate with you, whether it be live, whether it be in, on, on broadcast, or whether it be through a social media platform, from a kingdom perspective. Now I understand that there are a lot of people that are more submerged into what's happening globally nationally, domestically, politically, and, and hey, do you, boo. <laughs> but it should never take precedence over the kingdom of heaven. It should never be more important than who we are as a church in Christ. God always comes first. In all things. Always. And what I want you to do this morning is I want you to grow some very thick skin for the season that you and I are living in. Because we're too emotionally fragile 
as the body of Christ. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about the church in general. But we've become very fragile in our feelings. And we're easily offended. Let me say to you this, and, let, and I hope that you receive it in the right spirit, that the gospel is offensive to those that are perishing. That Jesus offended a lot of people, not because he didn't love them, not because he didn't care about them, not because he wasn't willing to lay down his life, because we know that not only was he willing, but he did. But he's offensive because what truth does is that exposes darkness. And when darkness is exposed, it's offended by the light. And so I want you to learn to have some thick skin for the season that we're living in. Because I don't think America is necessarily going to get better. I think more things are going to be exposed and are going to be brought to light. And this is why God desires His church to be about His Father's business or the the Father's business. This is our responsibility. And so when you see me post something, proclaim something, teach something, or preach something, I'm not coming from the perspective or the position of an American citizen. I'm coming from the perspective and the position of a citizen of heaven and as an ambassador of God that's trying to get you to think outside of the paradigm that this world has taught you to think in. Because we're not of this world. We live in the world. We're not going to be taken out of the world. In fact, Jesus prayed for us. God, they're going to be living in this world. They're going to have to deal with certain things. But I pray for them. Look at the book of John. You see a beautiful prayer of Jesus praying for not just the Christians of his time, but Christians throughout the millennia until his return for the bride of Christ. And so I want to ask you this question once again. Have you been with Jesus? Because how you answer that determines what your life is like. How you answer that determines how much authority and anointing you're walking in. How you answer that determines how you respond to people on social media, to co-workers, to bosses, to family, and extended family and friends when it comes to worldly issues, whatever it may be, you fill in the blank. Could be systemic race issues, could be um, critical race theory, could be social justice issues, could be political bends, could be all that. But listen to me clearly when I say to you, the gospel must always come first. And then as you serve God and love his people, a byproduct of that will be that you will address injustice, that you will address things that are not okay. And listen, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, Christians were not quiet when it came to governmental issues. We know that in the Old Testament, that every king had a prophet. And every prophet was an oracle of God. And that oracle God would speak the will of God to the king over Israel. Now, when it came to kings that were living in adultery or in wickedness, the prophets of God would confront them and speak out against them not because they didn't care about them, but they needed to expose the devil in the details. And so prophets would speak about kings and about rulers and about nations, the word of God. In the New Testament, we know that Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, used his own citizenship to stand before rulers and testify of the goodness of God in his life. And so, for those of you that may say that we're not supposed to be political, you're absolutely right. We're not being political. We're being biblical by confronting sin for what it is. 
And just because we're the church doesn't mean that we're supposed to be silent about it. And so if you get mad when we expose the, the darkness that's happening, then don't get mad and leave. Get mad and talk. Because the Bible says be angry, but sin not. So if your political bent or your feelings get hurt, instead of allowing the devil to push you out those doors, allow the Holy Spirit to draw you close. To come into an open conversation with each other, even in the church. Listen, it's okay to disagree and still be in the same family. It's okay not to see everything the same way and still love each other and honor one another. Stop being so sensitive. We're in covenant together. You're not allowed to divorce me. And I'm not allowed to divorce you. In fact, Jesus said, in scripture, throughout scripture, God hates divorce. And so my thing, could you imagine if me and Roxanne, every time we got into an argument, we couldn't confront our feelings and our disagreement and have some kind of conflict resolution if we're like, that's it, I'm gonna go to another woman. But that's what people do when they leave the bride, they go to another bride. Because they were unwilling to confront an issue that more than likely was a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation, an assumption, instead of just confronting it with the motivation of restoration. Is this okay? Can we talk about this stuff? Because if we're going to be the church of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be a spirit-filled, Bible-teaching, demon-casting, soul-reaching church, we're going to have to get over our feelings. And we're going to have to get over ourselves and lay down our arrogant pride and say, God, not my will, but your will be done. And so I'm coming to you as somebody who cares about you and loves you, but I'm sick and tired of the division. I'm sick and tired of the divisiveness that we've allowed, not in our church, but in the body of Christ as a whole. Because we don't allow that stuff here, do we? No, sir. Why? Because God hates division. God hates divisive people. He didn't say that he hates people with different of opinions. He didn't say that he hates people with different perspectives and paradigms. He says, I don't like people that cause division in my house. And this is his house. And we are his body. We are the church. We don't go to church. We are the church. And so let me say it again. Have you been with Jesus? Because how you answer that determines how you're living life right now. How you answer that determines whether you're living in victory or defeat. How you answer that determines whether you're living in faith or fear. How you answer that determines whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or a Christian. Acts chapter 4. Let's go there. Acts chapter 4. Let me give you a little bit of context. I'm not going to be able to finish this today. We're going to talk a little bit more about next Sunday. But I just got to drive this home. Because you're the body of Christ. You're the modern day expression of apostles. Teachers. Evangelists. Prophets. Pastors. You're the modern day expression of the fivefold ministry that's been activated by the power of the Holy Spirit and should be evident amongst the body of Christ. And if we're not careful, we could diminish church to, well, I just go to church on Sunday because it's good for my family. We could diminish church to just, well, I, it makes me feel good. We could diminish church to like, I leave with, you know, an encouraging word. No, this is a spiritual boot camp for an army. This is... The army of God. This is the family of God. This is, this is heaven's response to sin. 
It's the blood of Jesus working in and through the body of Christ, sharing the good news to the whosoever's of this world. And if, we, if we're not careful, we've already been socially conditioned to live apart from each other. Think about that with me for just, for, for just a minute. You've already been socially conditioned to live separately and isolated and far away from brothers and sisters in Christ. You've already been socially conditioned to fear certain things that you may or may not have to fear any longer. You've been socially conditioned to think a certain way about certain people because they keep saying it over and over and over and over again. If they could just say it enough, you'll start to believe it. You've already been socially conditioned by social media to view things and not to view others because of algorithms that are privy to who you are and how you're wired as a human being. And if we don't expose the devil in the detail, you'll find yourself entrapped by the snare and the strategy of Satan over your life. And the devil is real and he's running rampant right now. And if we're not careful as the church, as the body of Christ, as a fellowship that's moving forward into God's purpose and plan for what happens next, we can get so distraught and so vexed by what we see, by what we read, by what we hear. And this is why I want you to zone into what God has to say. Because how you respond to have you been with Jesus determines how you're living your life right now. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had just performed a miracle. They were out ministering the word of God. They were on outreach. They were like in the streets of Lawndale, throughout the South Bay, just sharing Jesus with other people. Tell me, have, have you heard about Jesus? Oh man, he took your sin and he took my sin and he nailed it to a cross. He took on all of our shame and crucified and he became the full payment for our, for our disobedience. And, and for those who would receive him, he would restore into a right relationship with the Father so that you could spend eternity in heaven and eternal love forevermore. And if you accept him right now, all things will pass away. All things will become that brand new and you will have an experience like any, uh, unknown to any other experience that you've ever had in your life. And they're sharing this with the community of people that are under Roman rule and, and they're out being bold as lions and, and telling them about the wonderful good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then they're arrested. The Bible says the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people and they were greatly disturbed because of the apostles teaching to the people proclaiming Jesus in Jesus the resurrection of the dead now you got to remember this was blasphemy this was blasphemous to the to the to the uh, uh, to the Jews and to the Pharisees and said to this organized religion this is blasphemy to them Penalty is punishable by death. In fact, how do we know that? Because they killed Jesus. They killed him for loving people. They killed him for raising people from the dead. They killed him for proclaiming that he is God manifest in the flesh. These are the same people that Peter and John are standing in front of. And the Bible says that they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But listen to what verse 4 says. But many people who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. I don't know about you, but a revival was taking place in Jerusalem. They were sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. They were declaring the good works of God. They, they were telling people about how Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And they were exposed. 
exposing it for what it was. And people were, were, were excited to receive this because they were living under Roman rule and they were living under the oppression and they were living in their sin and they were living in darkness. And here's God, the Messiah, a prophetic promise that came to pass and he dwelt among them. And when he dwelt among them, what did they do? Did they celebrate him? Did they honor him? Did they make him king? No, they killed him. The Bible says they seized Peter and John and because it was evening. But many who heard the message believed so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem and Annas and the high priest were there and so were Cephas, John, Alexander and the others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and, and began to question them and said this, by what power or what name are you doing this in? Because they were bewildered. Get the picture with me. They were bewildered. They were like, wait a minute. These guys are laying hands on people. They're praying for people. And miracles are taking place. Now, I don't know if you know this. We still believe that God still does miracles. Amen. We believe that we serve God, the same God who's yesterday, today, and forevermore the same. We believe that God is still doing miracles because you're sitting next to a miracle. Amen. And so here we read that they ask, by what power? Like, how are you guys doing this? Like, what demonic God, what demonic idol are you guys worshiping that's giving you the power to do this? And I'll show you why they said what they said. Because the Bible continues to say, the rulers of the elders of the people, we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and were being asked how he was healed. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised up from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Now, now they're standing with the lame man that was healed by the power of God that was working in them and through them and they're making a declaration the very same Jesus that you killed is this very same Jesus that gave us the power to lay hands on this lame man that he arose and he began to walk and this miracle didn't come from us but it came from the Father of Heaven and they're making this declaration and it's interesting to me that as they're making this declaration, they're telling him, you killed Jesus. The one that we speak on behalf of. Is it the name of Jesus Christ whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead? It is this man who stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone. You builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Listen, Mary, the mother of Jesus, won't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Come on, Gandhi has nothing to do with salvation. There aren't many ways to heaven. There's only one way, and his name is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There aren't many ways to God. There's only one way, and it's only through the blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said, no one goes unto the Father except through me. The apostles said, there is no name given under heaven by which we can be saved. There's no other name. In fact, the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow, whether you're still alive on earth or where you're dead standing before God in heaven, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's why I'm telling you what I told you in the beginning of this message. Have you been with Jesus? Because in verse 13, the Bible says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. 
they were astonished and they took note, watch what this says, that these men had been with Jesus. There was something about Peter and John that distinguished them from everybody else. There was something different about Peter and John that resembled and reflected Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There was something about Peter and John that gave them the authority and the boldness and the gifting to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. It didn't come from them. It didn't come from any, any natural training. It didn't come from their own personal gifts and, and talents. It came from the power of God working in and through their lives. And the same resurrection power that was in Jesus, the same resurrection power that was in Peter and John is the same resurrection power that lives inside in each and every single son and daughter of heaven. This is who we are. But these were unschooled, ordinary men. And so they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the men who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing that they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we doing with these men? In other words, like, like I want to kill them, but I can't. I was watching Gladiator yesterday, one of my favorite movies. And Caesar wanted to kill the gladiator, Maximus. <laughs> wanted to kill him. And he said, I won't make him a martyr because they'll love him even more. So I have to figure out another way. I gotta, I gotta find another deceptive way to get rid of him. And this is exactly what they were trying to do with Peter and John. Like, how do we get rid of them? Like, they're telling everybody about Jesus, 5,000 men. Now, if, if, if you know this about the Hebrew people, if men lead their way, the way, the wives and the children will follow. Let me talk to some men right now. If you lead the way spiritually, I promise you, your family will follow. But you have to live a surrendered life to Jesus. And you just can't take certain scriptures out of the Bible to fit your narrative. Honey, the Bible says submit. The Bible says wives were made to submit. Now hold up. The Bible says to submit to one, one another. Now we do know that there is, there are roles that men hold in the house. They are the spiritual leadership of the home. I'm going to talk to some feminists right now. Let your man lead. And you'll see the favor of heaven on your home. If he leads well, you'll be blessed. If he won't lead, then by all means lead. Let me say that again. God ordained it this way, that the husband is the pastor of the house. He's the provider. He's a protector. He's a spiritual leader. But he won't take up that mantle. Wife, lead honorably and respectfully so that God's hand could be on your house. But if you won't let him lead, then you're quenching the spirit in your house. God called us to lead together, hand in hand. Roxanne and I lead together, hand in hand. Hand in hand, we're submitted to one another in Christ. But these 5,000 men probably had wives and they had children, so the revival was more than 5,000, probably more like 15 or 20,000. Because we know that they had a lot of kids. They were like Latinos, they had kids everywhere. Just. <laughs> but these men were a problem. And they asked, what are we gonna do about these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they had performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop 
this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. What name? The name of Jesus. Then they called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of that day said that these are unschooled, ordinary men, they weren't like, wow, these guys are unschooled, ordinary men and they're doing miracles, signs and wonders. They're proclaiming the name of Jesus. Wow, that's awesome. They weren't complimenting it. I want you to get the tone of the scripture because sometimes the American language loses the tonality of scripture because the tonality here is like, is like and I'm going to put this in the EV translation Eddie Vargas translation they say it in this way how can God use people like that They're, there's nothing special about them like those two guys are fish they smell like fish like there's not like that 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 guy works in a cubicle in the office there's not there's nothing special the guys that guy's a mechanic there's there's nothing special that 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 woman she's she's a teacher she, nothing special that person's a musician there's, there's nothing special about them like these are unusual choices for God to use like why would the God of the heaven and the earth the creator of all the universe the one that breathed life into dirt and became man the one that opened the side of a man and pulled out a rib and made a beautiful woman the one that gave us the ability to birth children out the miracle of birthing out a living being the one that that put the stars where they belong and told the ocean where to stop and how high a mountain can go and why would why would he use a person like you you're like you were a drug addict like you were you're a thug like your wife is still a thug like like, like why no, like they're white, they're black, they're Hispanic, they're Asian, they're Polynesian, they're European. There's nothing special. That, that's the tonality that these religious leaders were saying it in. But you know what was special about those two guys? Is that they were with Jesus. In fact, let me read it again, because I don't want you to lose this. Now the leaders were surprised and confused. They looked at Peter and John and realized these were typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary. This is the voice translation. Um, fellows with extraordinary confidence. The leaders recognized them as companions of Jesus. So what, was, what made the difference? What made the difference is that these men not only spend time with Jesus, but they were being obedient to Jesus, they were serving Jesus, and they were out doing what Jesus commanded them to do. Because how you respond to, have you been with Jesus, will determine the way that you live your life, will determine the way that you love your family, will determine the way that you treat one another, will determine by what you post on social media, will determine by how you forgive people, will determine how you serve within the body of Christ, will we determine how you, you resolve conflict in your life. When the Jewish leaders were astonished by the boldness of Peter and John, they weren't impressed by who they were, but they were impressed by what they were able to do because of who they were. And it's incredible. Because they realized something powerful that they had been with Jesus it wasn't in their education although we honor and know that education is fantastic they had no formal religious training it wasn't in their credentials I mean even Saul of Tarsus who became Paul the Apostle if anybody could boast about credentials Paul said I could boast I was a Pharisee and the son of a 
Pharisee. I grew up learning the Levitical and Mosaic law. I grew up teaching it and I grew up protecting it. In fact, I was on my way to condemn some Christians on the road to Damascus. And then I had an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And my life was never the same again. Peter and John lived with Jesus for three years were discipled by Jesus himself. But we know that Peter ran and hid in fear when they were like, wait a minute. Like, aren't you one of the disciples of Jesus Christ? You know the story, right? Like, no, 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 I don't know him. But there was something different. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus promised them, listen, go to Jerusalem and wait because my father is gonna send you the Holy Spirit He's going to baptize you with fire. And you're going to speak with boldness. And you're not going to be afraid. Not even unto death. And we know that every single one of them died a martyr. With the exception of John. Who was banished to the island of Patmos. But they weren't... It wasn't like, like they were afraid to talk to people out on the street. Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? It wasn't like they were like in front of people that are at school or, or at college or in junior high or high school. It wasn't their co-workers. They were standing in front of the very people that murdered their Savior. And with boldness, they were like, are we going to listen to you or are we going to listen to God? With boldness. They're like, are we going to listen to the government or are we going to listen to God? Are we going to listen to what the president has to say or are we going to listen to what God has to say? Are we going to listen to what Newsom has to say or what God has to say? Are we going to listen to what our culture has to say or what God has to say? Are we going to listen to this party or that party or, or, or that movement or that movement? Who are we going to listen to? We're going to listen to God. We prefer God over you. And guess what? Guess what? fear God more than I fear you. These guys are talking to murderers. He's talking to the very people that can have him put to death on that Peter who ran. It's not like what's up? And you know what I pray? I pray that in this new season that we're moving into as a church, that our church, every single man and every single woman and every single young adult and every single marriage and every single kid would stand up with boldness and be the salt and light that God called us to be. That we would proclaim the good news regardless of what everybody else is doing. Look, this is not a gym. This is not a social environment where we come together in Kumbaya. This is where we learn how to fight. This is where we learn how to use our sword. Here's her, where we learn how to use the gift of the Spirit that God's given us. Because you all got gifts. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, I think some people in our church need to get baptized with fire. Because the fire of the Holy Ghost is what sets you apart from everybody else. Now hear me clearly, hear me clearly. Matthew chapter three, verse 11 through 12, John the Baptist says this, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is an open confession of your faith. The water symbolizing the washing away of your sin. And when you come back out of the water, you've been made new. But then he says this, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand and it will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquench unquenchable fire. You know what John is saying? John's saying, I baptize, baptize you with water with repentance of your sin, but somebody's coming after me and he's gonna baptize you with his Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, when we surrender, listen to me clearly, 
when we surrender to God and we accept the gift of salvation, by grace we are saved. When we receive that gift, the Holy Spirit comes on all of us and cleanses us from all of our sin and makes us brand new and seals us for the day of His return. We are saved by grace. But hear me clearly. You will not experience the fire of heaven until you're fully submitted in obedience to the call of God on your life. Because there were a lot of people that were walking around telling people about God, telling people about Jesus, telling people about the cross, and then the disciples roll up and go, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit? They're like, no. And he's like, bro, you need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit. They were like, well, give him to me. And they laid hands on him. Boom! Fire came on. They started speaking in tongues. They started to prophesy. They started to bleed with boldness. And nobody could stop them. Nobody could shut their mouth. Because they were living in fear. They were living in faith. Because they knew who they were in Christ Jesus. I pray that the church raises up some men and some women that would surrender. on the eggshells around each other and start scrambling some eggs and making some really good omelets. I'm asking you as your pastor to be the man that God called you to be. To be the woman that God called you to be. To be the family that God called you to be. To not allow the culture of this world, the ways of this world to creep in to your life, to your ministry, to your church your ministry to the way that you serve because God is about to do a new thing and I want us to be fully prepared to receive it and to be a big part of it now I'm talking to some people that may be may be dealing with some issues and for whatever reason right now there's been this fear about COVID there's been this fear about life, there's been this fear about finances, there's been this fear about who's in government and what's gonna happen. And you know what, we don't have any control of any of that. Our job is to be ambassadors of heaven. And so we need a fresh outpouring of the Spirit's fire. And if you'd be honest and say, Pastor, I want that. I want that in my life. I want that in my family. I want that on my kids. I want to walk in that. I want to live in that. I want to lead from that. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet and say, I want the Holy Spirit. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want that fire on my life. I want that fire in my life. I want Him to burn away.
away all the things and all the impurities and everything that he doesn't want in my life anymore. I want him to separate the wheat from the chaff. I want him to cleanse me and empower me and lead me and guide me and direct me and anoint me and empower me and fill me with that fire that Peter and John lived in. That same fire that Paul the Apostle lived in. That same fire that Jesus talked about. That same fire that we've seen under living. I want that for my life. I want that for my future. And if that's you, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come to this altar. We're going to lay hands on you. 
Holy Spirit, we honor you. We know that it's impossible for us to be who you birthed us to be without the breath of life that you give to your church. So Father, I pray that we remain steadfast and unremovable, unmutable as we live a surrendered life to you. We want to be led by your spirit. We know that it's easy to sing when we're on the mountaintop. But Lord, we want to learn how to sing in the valleys. Because you are with us, we don't fear any evil. year, the loved ones that they've lost, the, the finances that have been taken, the businesses that have been closed, the jobs that have, that have gone away. And there's been bad habits that have been formed, addictions that have started to take root, positions and paradigms that the Holy Spirit wants to break right now. I see God breaking chains right now. That there are chains that are being broken because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's freedom. And the Spirit of God is so tangible right now in this place. And if that's you and you need freedom, I want you to raise your hands to heaven and surrender. Because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to break some chains right now. 
I believe that the Spirit of God in this room right now wants to save your soul. If you would just close your eye, bow your heads, maybe you're here, you don't know Jesus, but he loves you. Oh my, does he love you? But you're not walking with him. And so if I were to ask you, have you been with Jesus? Your answer is no. I go to church, but I haven't been with Jesus. I believe in the word, but I haven't been with Jesus. I'm serving in ministry, but I haven't been with Jesus. And I just believe God wants to break some chains. God wants to set some people free. Maybe you're here and it's your first time and you're like, I don't even know what to make of all of this. All I know is that I know that I'm not right with Jesus. And I need to be rescued this morning. And if that's you, would you just kind of wave at me and tell me that I need, you need Jesus right now. And so, Father, as gentle as you are, as powerful as you are, break every chain in this room right now. Set your people free from the brokenness of this life, helping them to understand that they're no longer subject to the pains and the hardships of this world, that you are with us and you are for us and you're leading us out of the valley even now because no weapon that's ever been formed will ever prosper but it'll be cast down I see I see the fiery darts of hell being extinguished by the presence and the power of God even now come on if you want more if you want more of God, if you want more of this, you're going to have to spend more time with Jesus. Come on. Come on. Say it, say it again. No other name. There's no other name.
said, isn't God good? Yeah. Is it okay that we have these kind of church services in the South Bay? I don't know about you, but I want more. I want more. And you know what? God is always ready to give you more. But if you want to experience more of God, you got to surrender more to God. Let me say it again. If you want to experience more of God, you got to surrender more to God. And if you'll do that, I promise you, you won't leave that space the same. I'm excited for what God is going to do through Restoration Life. We want to welcome you home. I just honor you, and I need to honor the time because we have our Spanish service coming in right behind us. But listen, tomorrow night, where's the army of men in the house right now? Tomorrow night, 7.30, get here early. We're going to have a phenomenal time. We love you. God bless you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks so much for tuning in with us. We hope that this message spoke to you in a very personal way. And if it did, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, if this is your first time tuning in, we want to connect with you. Head over to our website at restoration-life.com or our Our Life Church app. Click Church Online, fill out one of our Connect cards, hit Send, and we'll see you next time.